I am so happy to be with Dr. James Locke this morning. Um, he's a clinical professor of psychiatry and behavioral health at Stanford Children's Health and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, Stanford. Good morning, Dr. Locke. Thank you. Good morning. Nice yeah. to be here. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, you know, AIM, we fund innovative solutions to youth mental health issues. And one of the most pressing and deadly issues is one that you work on, and that is working with eating disorders. And I just, I just want to say that all of us at AIM and the parents and people who will watch this and learn from your research, we're deeply grateful for your particular approach to eating disorders. And I think from a parent's perspective, you know, really understanding the guilt and hopelessness that parents feel. And I think your research, your life's work and your approach to care is something that we wanna talk about today. But I just wanna first acknowledge that as a parent and as other parents, you know, we really appreciate your work on behalf of kids. So yeah, yeah, you're, well, yeah, thank you. So um, your research philosophy, can you share a little bit about that and sort of describe what parent guilt is and the philosophy behind your approach when it comes to helping parents and in yeah. turn their kids cope? Yeah. Well, in a general sense, I just want to say that um, parents are really important to children. Hmm. Um, that um, the idea that um, somehow a, a psychotherapist working alone with a kid is going to actually be effective is kind of a not, a, it's really kind of a non-starter if you really think about it, because kids are always embedded in their families and, and, and this, the therapist may see them for an hour or two a week or something to that effect. The lion's share of what goes on in the child's life is in the context of their family. And that's how it should be, right? That's just, that's the nature of, of, of how um, us as human creatures um, build out our um, capacities. Uh, we're born uh, with very limited skills. We can't talk, we can't walk, we can't feed ourselves. So that we need our parents from the very start. We need all of that. And so there's a really famous um, child analyst named Winnicott. Uh, and he said, there's no such thing as a baby. And what he meant by that was there's no such thing as a baby alone there are always parents and families that are going to create the environment in which children grow, nurture, and learn. So that's the starting point in a way is to really remember and um, hold on to the idea that if you're going to help children, um, the best resource and a necessary resource is, is their family uh, mm -hmm. and, and their parents. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's sort of the starting point. And when you, Look at the history of the treatment of anorexia nervosa in specific, specifically and eating disorders more generally. That hasn't been though the main tenet. The main tenet has been something quite different from that. Um, starting way back when anorexia nervosa was first described in the 1870s, it's one of the oldest clinically described uh, consistently the same way described illnesses. Um, parents were seen as causing, making worse, um, likely to be um, bad influences, um, so that the solution was to take the kids away and put them in a hospital, mm -hmm. usually for years at a time, two, three years. It wasn't like a short thing. Um, and parents were seen as not helpful. And that strategy, um, which was also, by the way, something that people believed about autism mm -hmm. and also about yeah. Yeah. schizophrenia, um, just isn't true. Mm. And so, um, but it's taken a really long time to shift, um, in particular for anorexia nervosa and eating disorders because of a view that somehow parents, and often this means mothers, um, 
their preoccupations around eating or food or dieting has somehow caused this problem in their young in their young daughters uh, mostly again even though boys get the disorder the whole idea this is sort of socioculturally um warped idea um mm -hmm. and no evidence that it works so, you know i think it's i think it still exists oh it sure does you we're talking and you're talking about in the past but that notion those that mythology still i mean i know i still hear parents you know talking that way as if it's a it's their fault or like you just talked about their diet and all their obsession with food has caused this and also that isolation away like treatment away from family is the way to do it yeah well, it's definitely still a very um, big part of um, the surround when a parent hears that there, and it's one of the reasons there's so much stigma um, with um, particular anorexia and bulimia that uh, there's so much more shame around it because there's so many more messages and much stronger messages. I mean, you, they used to say the same thing as I mentioned about autism and we've done a really good job with organizations like Autism Speaks to really saying, oh no, no, this is actually not because mm -hmm. the mother was cold and uh, you know, somehow caused this problem. We know that's not the case. We actually know that's not the case for anorexia too, in the sense that we know there's a genetic and environmental portion to these things, but we also know that that's just not an explanation that ha has any data to support it. What we do know is kids are kids get when kids get sick, parents worry, and and they look for what caused this, and they often look to themselves. So they're easy, easy prey for these bad ideas. Um, I, I must have done something wrong, or she would be okay. That's just such a great takeaway for parents, just to relieve parents of that guilt and that sense of responsibility that they caused this. And then if we can relieve parents from those feelings of guilt, then we can start the process of healing and then talk about the kinds of, of strategies and approaches that your research brings. Because when parents can be, especially mothers, can be relieved of that guilt, we can begin the process of healing through by the, what you talk about is that family-based therapy. You talked about it a little bit more. And I love that you talk about not so much skill building, but confidence building in mm -hmm. parents. Could you, could you describe that a little bit? Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, and just to build on what you were just saying. So it's when you're guilty or you feel like you've done something wrong, you're pretty hesitant because you don't know if you're gonna make it worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're really like, well, I must, I'm, I've done something wrong already. I, I, I'm not messing this up anymore. Uh, you try something and it doesn't work. You go, oh, well, that's not working. I, I clearly don't know what I'm doing. So your own sense of capacity as a parent gets undermined mm -hmm. and your confidence gets undermined. Something that's very, strange when you've actually been feeding and providing meals for your family for years successfully like suddenly it what and uh, and that so what the first thing about getting rid of guilt um and <clears throat> self-blame is that it it gives you we, th those those feelings create feelings of inadequacy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. incompetence and once, once those things are going, it's very hard to be effective as a parent. It shuts you down, yeah. It does. So in the first thing we try and do in family-based treatment, um, and it is really one of the very first things we try and do, is to help parents recognize that we do not think they caused this problem. We're the professionals. That is, we're not here to fix you as parents. You are not the problem. The problem is anorexia nervosa. Mm -hmm. And yes, it has, con it has made it difficult for you to do some things that you used to do easily, but it's not because you are the problem. It's mm -hmm. because this illness is really hard and it requires thinking about things a little differently than you normally would have been able to 
manage. And if you've managed with your other children um, and, uh, and they're fine. So the first thing is to sort of remind them that they're not the problem. And the second thing is to remind them that they actually know how to do this. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. They have, they have that already inside of them. Yeah. They've been doing yeah. it for years. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like this kid was born with anorexia. Um, <laughs> they, they have been, this kid's been doing fine up to this point. Right. right. Um, and that's the, and remind them, you know, it's, it's also, you've lost confidence, but it doesn't mean you've lost the ability to actually solve this problem. Yeah, so that's really sort of a, a self-help motivation strategy for the parents themselves. And that really is, I think, fundamental to family-centered care. I know at Packard, um, your, your hospital and, and other hospitals, we talk about a lot about family-centered care and the importance of it. And what you're describing is sort of that deeper commitment to the family-centered care and building the confidence of the parents, because we know, like you said earlier, by addressing those issues, building the confidence of parents, relieving parents of their guilt, we can start this path toward, toward healing. And that, that child, that adolescent needs their family more than anyone, you know, they need yeah. their, that they need their parents and family to be strong. And this is true against, uh, 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 upon all kind of mental health disorders and illness in general kids need their families strong around them. We do. And what happens is um, we try and help the family and initially the parents in particular um, understand how um, having to deal with anorexia has de-skilled them a bit. Um, that they've, how they lost their confidence and how they can rebuild it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And we don't tell them, here's what you do here are the skills that you need to do. Because well, for one thing, every family uh, has to solve the problem of eating in their home themselves. Um, and I should say just something about that um, quickly, which is that you can't get well from anorexia in a hospital or a residential program because they're not the real world. You're not eating there is not like eating in the real world. So, you know, and it doesn't, so one of the things we do know about learning is that you, you generalize learning when you've learned it in the environment which you're gonna practice it. So kids need to eat in their, with their families at home and in the school and with their friends, not in some residential treatment center or hospital. Yes. Of course you can get them to eat there because that's, that's all you're really doing there. None of the stresses, strains, relational issues that you have to manage are being really brought to fore. They're all mm -hmm. kind of excluded from that. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna learn how to drive, you can learn how to drive on a video game, but you can't really drive a car yet. You have to actually get in the car and drive it. The same is true for eating. You actually have to eat with your family, eat with your friends, eat at school, be able to travel and, and eat on, on trips and in hotels. Though this is how we learn. So that's why it's so important that it be at, actually at home with, uh, and in the homes of the families, uh, as well as clearly with the parents um, who are in their usual role of taking care of their kids. Yeah, yeah. So, so for parents who are struggling, they just say, I just can't get him or her to eat at home. Mm -hmm. How do you, how would you, could you give us like an example of how you would build that parent's confidence to, to do that, to, to, you know. and I, I do want to mention too, that, you know, feeding our children is, is such for mothers, especially is such an innate like desire and, and it's all tied up in all of that in sure. mother too. So how would you just, could you give us an example or, for, or, or some, sort of guides for parents that are trying to yeah. get their child to eat at home? Well, first of all, every parent, parents that come to see us, they all think that, they all have that experience. I can't get her to eat or him to yeah. eat. It's not like, oh, I wanna come see you because I can. 
<laughs> yeah, um, right, right. So that, that, that is the starting point. It's mm -hmm. not it's everyone. So just so you understand that every single family, if they could on their own, without any help, have met, solved this problem, then they would never see me. So, mm -hmm. so that's, it's not, an, it's not unusual. It is the usual situation. And how do you start people on a journey of learning to recoup their skills um, and to um, learn that they actually can do what they have not been doing um, successfully? Well, that comes down to a couple of things. The first is to emphasize that you have no choice. Hmm. That your child is going to get really sick, could die, might have to go live in some place far away, away from family and friends, if you don't. Hmm. And so emphasizing that, you know, there's no getting out of this. You can, you can try, but it, 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 and it won't be pretty. Yeah, but, it's not easy. No. <laughs> there's, no, there's no formula that you can just whip up and make it happen. No, if, if there was, and, and people want that, of course, yeah. I think they do. And, and if there was such a thing, believe me, I would give it to everybody. And if, if a hospital cured people, I would put them in the hospital and cure them. But mm -hmm. that, it, it doesn't. And, mm -hmm. and, and we know this. A um, hundred years of doing it, and we know. Uh, um, so the first thing is that it's like this is a problem. Don't run from it. Second is you have been trying, but you haven't been confident in what you're doing. You haven't had people to think it through with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not tell you what to do, but think it through with you and give you support around your decisions. And confirm that, it, that helps a lot to have those decisions and the, those, what, the way you're approaching it confirmed. Yeah. That's the part of the confidence too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One way we put it is you're an expert in your family. We know about anorexia. We want to bring those two things together. Mm, beautiful, yeah. So that's what we do. And usually this means um, helping people recognize that they have compromised more than they, they really should have. Like, uh, uh, like well, you, she, well, she'll eat salad. Well, but is that getting you anywhere? Because she's not gaining weight on those salads. But she'll at least eat it. Okay, but what do you think? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, is that really what she needs? No, she needs to eat pasta with cheese sauce. Correct. You're yeah. right. Yeah. You're no, you know what to do. So people sometimes say, well, we, she needs to see a dietitian to tell her what to eat. No, you know what she needs to eat. Mm -hmm. And I'm not yeah. in any way saying dietitians don't have expertise or anything like that. But I'm saying that actually it's not rocket science what they need to eat. They yeah. Need and it, it, that, that lack of confidence makes people like un, unable to do what they already know. And so, and then to go off to the experts outside of them because they don't have the confidence to trust what they already know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another thing that happens is that parents may have different, are not working together. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so that's another thing to we really try and help people realize early on that uh, uh, the kid with anorexia uh, will use the parents' uh, to try and split them apart so that there's not consistency in there. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. we'll, so that is another thing. We need you to agree. Um, you know, that's really important to make any consistent behavior change. The parents need to actually agree. And so now the parents usually know this, but the illness and their worry and anxiety about it has had an effect on their relationship in terms of agreeing. Yeah, yeah. The other thing is giving up too soon. Oh, it, yeah. It, it's mm -hmm. too much pushback. These kids are often wonderful, high achieving. I mean, I, I often say they don't have straight A's, they don't likely have anorexia, and, and, and or whatever it is they're achieving in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they've often been very self driven. Yeah. So parents have been used to being able to let them run their show. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, the the that that kind of of you know self discipline that it takes for this to be even begin is yes. extraordinary self discipline. Yeah, and self motivation and all that. Right. So here's here's a tough question, Doctor Locke. I have to ask it. I I we keep up at AIM on you know how long it takes kids to get to treatment. So the last statistic that I just read was it's an average of, of 50 days if you have a crisis getting, at, um, and you may have other statistics about that. So, you know, someone can't just dial up and get this type of, of treatment, this type of therapy. So one of the things that AIM funded for your research in this project is videos and other types of tools um, could you talk a little bit, a bit about that and how, you know, we talk about wraparound services and other things that parents can have access to while they're waiting to get into treatment? Well, first of all, yes, it is a huge problem across child and adolescent mental health that um, getting care um, and access to care uh, is a challenge. And it's particularly a challenge uh, for specialty issues mm -hmm. like anorexia. Uh, mm -hmm. So the normal wait is 50 days, but for someone with anorexia or bulimia, if you're trying to get a therapist, there are fewer of them, right? So uh, fewer experts means fewer um, opportunities to get access. So that's a, a real challenge. And so if we think about my journey with trying to figure out how to help families. The first part is like finding something that helps them. And that's the strategy we talked about with family-based treatment and helping families learn how to be effective after they've kind of become de-skilled by the illness. And, and, and the second thing though, is how do we make that available to more people? Mm -hmm. um, and um, how do we, uh, so that, because one of the things about anorexia specifically is that it's, comes on with a bang and it is really you can get so sick from it you really can't wait so mm -hmm. it's a real for me uh, a, a, a hugely important issue that access uh, issue and so you know i wrote books for parents uh help your teenager be an eating disorder it's a, it's a book i wrote for parents uh, with daniel lagrange we published um and I think first in 2012 and then the new version in 2015 or something like that. The point being that educating parents is like really one of the hallmarks of what to do to, you know, what, what are you dealing with so that you can move forward. More recently, um, and uh, we had begun to look at whether families could use the approaches that I've been describing to you without as much therapist's time and mm -hmm. therapist's expertise doing it. And what inspired that actually were families who would contact me and say, oh, we bought your treatment manual and we couldn't find a therapist, so we just did it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they read the book, even though we say in the book, this is not self-help. Um, um, they, they said, we had no choice. We had to do that. Mm -hmm. And we were successful. So I knew some families could do that. And it didn't really surprise me that some could. We began then to look at whether or not we could do something that would be even more helpful. And we de developed a, um, some videos that um, would parents could use to watch the videos and then a therapist in a would meet with them and discuss what the content was. Um, much briefer, mm -hmm. um, instead of an hour, and it was just the parents that, that would come, not the kid also, just the parents. Um, and so it was a much easier thing for parents to do. And what we found in our initial studies was that um, people who wanted to do it, they did pretty well, the mm -hmm. kids did well. And then more recently, um, we did a small trial comparing in person to uh, this kind of videos plus a small amount of therapy. And we found in that study that they actually did really similarly too. Right, exactly. yeah, similar outcomes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. very, very yeah. similar yeah. outcomes. Yeah. But it was too small to actually know for sure whether it works. And we're, and 
So we're hoping, fingers crossed, that a major study will be funded by NIH, we'll see, um, uh, to let us really test it. But in the meantime, to that's your- That's the National Institutes of Health for parents who may be listening who don't know what that is. Yet. Oh, sorry, that's, that's okay. the funding body for research in the United States. The National Institute of Mental Health is the specific one that funds mental health research. But while we were developing those studies, the wait lists during the pandemic for eating disorder treatment around the world mm -hmm. just skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. we, we had this because therapists were overwhelmed, um, there was less time, so on. So we began to look at the idea of could parents use these videos as a uh, strategy to help them kind of weather the period between yeah. knowing there's a problem and getting into care. And that's where AIM came in. Um, and was interest, they were interested in supporting our looking into that idea. Um, and we were really excited about um, seeing whether or not that actually will be helpful and how. You know, we expect some families will do really well because we, we know that some did. Mm -hmm. We know that some probably won't be able to use it as well as others, but we're gonna see actually if it's a possibility and we're gonna combine the AIM study with other studies that are doing similar things um, in Australia and in Canada um, that have different healthcare systems but still have access problems. I mean, right, right. they do for different reasons, but they mm -hmm. still do. So we're, we're hoping that this additional, these additional strategies, which are actually still more about parental empowerment parental ownership and management will make it easier, reduce the load of people who need actually to get into the, the, the other treatments, be able to use less service time if they do. Mm -hmm. So that's the hope about that's this. It. And it, it's, it's really the only kinds of answers that we can come up with right now. I mean, it's really because we have to do something as parents wait for treatment. So we have to surround people with hope and other tools. Now, the unfortunate thing for the parents maybe watching this now is that, you know, those, those videos, or you can talk about this, aren't really available yet. But AIM, part of what AIM strategy is to kind of jumpstart making these things, uh, like we talked about, that funding in between an, a larger NIH study on the same kind of thing, we will give that gap funding to get you going to, with the idea that these tools can be brought to parents in a quicker time frame. So Dr. Locke, I know that you have a large plan for how to increase access to care for, for kids and families and parents who are suffering. Could you talk a little bit about what the plan is, the long-term strategies and sort of how you'll come about making that a reality? Well, I really appreciate that question because first of all, um, one of the reasons I do the work that I do is so that I can reach a broader scale, right? It's, you know, if, if, if I just treat one kid in my office, that's great, but I really want now to have the reach of the evidence-based treatments that are useful to get way beyond what I can do in my office or my clinic at Stanford or Children's Hospital or so on. And there, there are several strategies that we're working on to do that. Um, one is video conferencing, number one. We can do treatments now by video conference around the entire United States uh, in studies. And other, so that creates access, right? So for people mm -hmm. in Utah yeah. or Wyoming where there are no eating disorder, um, outpatient treatment programs, they, there's, it's possible to get care in a different way. Another way is through training uh, people. So, um, but using online strategies. So these are training therapists. Um, they sign up, they get a set of training videos and they can learn how to do the treatment. Mm -hmm. so they don't have to go somewhere. They don't have to pay so much money for it. There's a bunch of things like that. So you're increasing capacity in that way. Then what we were talking about, guided self-help. Guided self-help 
is a way in which less therapist time is used, less family time is used, much more efficient, cost-effective. So there's twice as much essentially time for every therapist to, to do the treatments than they would. So you're increasing yeah. capacity yeah. again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing uh, is trying to prevent people getting to that point of needing care through early identification of kids who are going to be referred through wait lists or so forth can, can a self-help version of FBT be useful for at least a portion of those people to sort of take them out of the, right, right. Uh, of the all the way getting to need care. Mm -hmm. So you can think about all those things that way. And then the fifth thing is through the use of digital and, and um, uh, related strategies to um, make care more easily uh, available through uh, our uses of watches and phones and computers. Mm -hmm. that, that access um, to the materials, so much easier now, so much more available, um, that, that, that makes scaling it a big and important thing. So for me, you know, there's a opportunity here to move the dial from, you know, what was a, in my lifetime, essentially as a therapist, main treatment in a hospital for weeks or months at a time to having um, parents and families manage things as autonomously as possible using as little therapy time with people that they may still need some or they may not mm -hmm. so that more kids can get better quicker that that vision for the future is is very hopeful and i know we all know that it is in the future and it does take time that we at aim and you don't want to put therapies out or you know treatments out without having the evidence behind it and that's why we are so interested in funding research and really kind of life's work like yours because of that we, we want to see a day when we have these this wraparound approach to addressing these youth mental health issues without necessarily having to rely on like you said out um, inpatient treatment or time lots of time with a therapist we know right now we have a shortage of clinicians available to treat the massive amount of need we have. So this partnership with your work and with AIM and our strategies that we, our, our, our shared goals around that, I just really deeply appreciate your partnership. You know, we at AIM, you know, we fund this research, but we also consider you a partner in, in this, this vision for just a better world and a better way to love, support, treat families and children who are, are struggling. So Dr. Locke, are there any closing things that you'd well, like to I, share? Well, I just wanna say that um, AIM, uh, this mission and what it's trying to do uh, and how it helps is critical to being mm -hmm. able to move the dial on things, especially early on, um, that are promising ideas, but not yet proven. And so that you can actually get them to a place where they can be tested, mm -hmm. where the costs are high to test them, but you don't test things that aren't. So you, you, it's a, it's a, it is a fail fast or succeed fast kind of thing. And um, I think that is such an important and wonderful thing that AIM uh, does and um, certainly I, I've been involved with AIM for a long time in different ways um, and so appreciate um, what you as an organization uh, mm. have done uh, much more broadly than just me but um, I appreciate what, what you're doing for me and this one well it's not for me but really not for me it's for, for everyone um, yeah. but um, it's, it's, it's I just want to say thank you for that and um, we so, we in my lab, in my clinic, we, we do appreciate what AIM has done for us. Thank you. Yeah, and we appreciate your work. Thank you. And we'll be in close touch. And I, I just hope, I know this will be very, very helpful for a lot of people. Thank you, Dr. Walker.